All right, so uh, so here we are again using um, using statistics to um, to bridge that ever increasing social distance, and by doing so, bringing us all that much closer together. So our diagnostic journey, um, we said kind of first step, um, kind of get acquainted with your data, check your data, look for uh, look for kind of data entry errors, i.e. Right, do some data cleaning. Um, step two, check for model-based outliers. That's what we just most recently talked about. And then we said step three was to go ahead and test your assumptions. All right, so we've talked about kind of four key critical assumptions um, that sort of drive the um, drive the functionality of our regression model. That is, our regression model is sort of only valid, is only true, is only useful if these assumptions are met. Now, recall, right, that the residuals, right, our model residuals are our best guess for the unknown realization of the random variable E for the actual theoretical error in our hypothesized regression model. Also recall, right, our four assumptions, our four assumptions are what, right? Our four assumptions are the errors have a mean of zero, the homogeneity of errors, right? The errors have a common variance sigma squared, does not depend on the actual observation, does not depend on X. Um, the errors follow a normal distribution and right, 4th of July assumption, the errors are all independent of one another. So, right, that, if we put that in kind of a 506 parlance, we would say that the errors are IID. Right? IID means independent, identically distributed. They follow a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a common variance sigma squared. Right? So our assumptions are all assumptions about that error term E. The residuals E hat are our best guesses for those E's. So it makes sense that if we want to test the assumptions, we would do so through our residuals. We talked a lot um, last slide about outputting those residuals. And so now we're gonna actually talk about how we can use those residuals to uh, test the effectiveness or test uh, whether or not our assumptions are satisfied. Yep, so there they are. We, we know them, I just stated them. One, two, three, four. Let's start with normality. Um, lots of different ways to test for whether or not your errors follow a normal distribution. The easiest and generally most effective way, probably the most commonly practiced way by um, traditional statisticians, is to just look at a histogram of the residuals, right? So we check for, right, the histogram is what? The histogram is a way of looking at the shape of a distribution. Shape of a distribution is like describing its, right, its actual underlying distribution. Does it have this nice symmetric bell shape to it? We look at a histogram, maybe a stem and leaf plot, and say, does that look normal or not? Now, regression is what we refer to as robust to violations um, of assumption of normality. Robust, what does that mean? It means that like, if, if the assumption is like slightly violated, it's not that big a deal. We need a pretty, um, a pretty flagrant, um, a pretty egregious, a very striking violation of normality for our model assumption to fall apart. That is, we want our histogram to look like drastically, obviously, without any shade of any doubt, not normal. So if you find yourself looking at a histogram of residuals and you find yourself kind of waffling back and forth, like, eh, I don't know, it looks kind of normal, but eh, I don't know, maybe a little bit of skew over here and I'm not sure about that tail over there. Maybe it's not normal. I, I keep going back and forth, right? If you find yourself going back and forth, you're probably fine. The worrisome, troublesome, bad situations are where, like, you look at that graph and it's like a slap in the face. Like, you just immediately look at it and you're like, wow, that is not even close to normal. 
So again, we're looking for very striking, egregious de deviations from normality. Now, when I talk about looking at a, at a graph of residuals, I can do so um, using the plots command in proc univariate. Um, and we'll, we'll look at an example of what that output would look like in just a second. Um, I want to talk very briefly about some other ways of assessing normality. Um, another way is by looking at the skewness and kurtosis of the residuals. So we're probably familiar with the idea of skewness, right? So in an introductory statistics class, we talk about the idea you have symmetry. Normal distribution symmetric. Things that are not symmetric, so the sort of opposite of symmetry, is what we call skewness. So there are there's a numerical measurement called skewness that basically says whether something is symmetric or skewed. A normal distribution should be symmetric. So so the larger this value is, or the closer it is to like a skewness, right, the more indicative it is that our residuals don't follow a normal distribution. Incidentally, right, from a 505 perspective, right, we think of the mean as kind of being like related to the first moment, right, like the expectation of X is the mean. The variance, right, the measurement of variation is like the second moment, right, the variation is a function of the expected value of X squared. The skewness is actually related to the third moment, right, the expected value of X cubed. And the fourth quantity of a distribution is called kurtosis. This one's maybe a little less known. You could Google it, um, look it up in Wikipedia. Kurtosis is basically like a measurement of the fatness of the tails, how much area there is in a tail. So like a normal distribution and a T distribution are both perfectly symmetric, but they differ in terms of their kurtosis. They have different values for kurtosis. Kurtosis actually relates to the fourth moment of a distribution expected value of x to the fourth and right more simply more plainly it measures how much area there is in a tail t distribution has more area in the tail than a normal distribution so we could look at we could look at things just like we can try to as, like assess like the true mean of a distribution by looking at its sample mean there are like values of sample skewness values of sample kurtosis we could we could look at those and see how close they are to the values we would expect from a normal distribution. So that's one way of assessing normality. I think I talk in a little bit more detail, like next slide about that. Um, so this is something called the normal probability plot, sometimes also referred to as a QQ plot, a uh, quantile quantile plot. I think I'll talk about that with its own slide. And then there's also actually hypothesis tests. Um, these hypothesis tests are called goodness of fit tests. Um, there's like there's quite a bit of them. Probably the Kamalgarov Smirnov test for normality is maybe um, the more widely used of them all. Although we'll see that I, I would actually suggest not using any of them. So yeah, so skewness and kurtosis. Um, this approach is used um, by econometricians. Um, there's actually something called, and pff, don't ask me how to pronounce that one, um, Jacques Barra test. Um, and so it's a hypothesis test. It creates a test statistic. The test statistics foundation is that sample skewness and sample kurtosis I was talking about. And then you can, right, you get that test statistic. You see how far it is from something. If it's far enough, right, then you sort of reject the null hypothesis of normality and you say that you don't think it's normal. Um, you could compute this test statistic and its p-value um, using a procedure called PROC AUTOREG. So those of you that are a little bit more financially minded, you can maybe do some Googling and kind of research that stuff. It's to use maybe in your field, um, but by kind of like the more general population of statisticians, it's not used that often. So I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail other than just kind of kind of bring it to the forefront of your awareness. Uh, maybe the thing that's used like second most often by statisticians might be uh, this normal probability plot. Um, the normal probability plot uh, makes a graph of the ordered observations versus the normal order statistic means or maybe sometimes medians. And you can kind of think about this, uh, maybe meditate on that second bullet point. If the sample truly follows a normal distribution, 
then the plot should be like a straight line with a slope of one. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And I'll show you an example of a normal probability plot in just a few slides. That is, right, we expect this kind of this kind of y equals x. So y the equation y equals x is a is a line with slope one. And so right, our 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 equation is that that x with like the parentheses i. If you take in five oh five, five oh six, you're probably familiar with that notation. If not, that just refers to the order statistic, right? So like without the parentheses, x one just means like the like the the x value for our first observation. But x parentheses 1 means the smallest value of x. It's like the first observation of x if they were ordered. So x parentheses 1 is the smallest value. x parentheses n is the largest value. x parentheses 2 is the second smallest value. So kind of the idea is like, if this really comes from a normal distribution, we would expect that that x parentheses one, the actual smallest value of, um, well, actually here our um, x's are referring to our to our residuals. So x parentheses one would be our smallest residual, and we would expect it to equal that expected value of capital x parentheses one, which is basically saying the what we would expect the smallest value to be if it in fact came from a, a normal distribution, right? So what that's basically saying, it's a, it's a plot of the actual ordered observations to what we would expect them to be if in fact they came from a normal distribution. So in the ideal situation, this should look like a straight line. They should be equal to one another. And right, the more it deviates from a straight line, the stronger the evidence against normality. This normal probability plot can also be created with the plots command in proc univariate. And then finally, right, there's hypothesis tests that we can use to also assess normality. Um, for all of these hypothesis tests, the null hypothesis is that the data comes from a normal distribution. So in terms of satisfying our assumptions, we want to fail to reject the null hypothesis. A little bit, a little bit opposite of what we typically do. Typically, we're really excited about small p-values. Here, we're kind of crossing our fingers and open for large p-values. And there's like a bunch of different ones. We'll see it um, in the output. I think I'll show us an example um, of all the ones. Again, they usually agree with one another. And that's kind of often what I focus on. There's like maybe three or four tests. And I usually kind of say, like they all agree, or if they disagree, maybe I'll, I'll use some other approach. Um, but if you were to try to pick one over the other, probably the kamalgarov smirnov test is the one that's, um, that's used most frequently. Now, I understand like for, for us as like students, as like beginners, um, I have observed that students like love doing these hypothesis tests. And I certainly see like the allure of it. I see the attraction of it. It's nice to kind of have this kind of black and white approach. It's very cut and dry. I look at my p-value, is it more or less than 0.05? And that tells me what to do. And I don't have any responsibility. It feels uncomfortable doing something subjective, like looking at a histogram and saying, hey, this looks normal, this doesn't look normal. It feels unsettling. So I, I get it. Um, but, 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 the recommendation is to avoid hypothesis tests. Again, it, it varies a little bit from field to field. Econometricians tend to like hypothesis tests a lot, um, but, but general practice statisticians tend to try to avoid them, at least for this type of thing. Um, why? It kind of goes back to what I said about um, about regression being robust to violations of normality. These hypothesis tests, particularly for large samples, will detect very small, very slight deviations from normality. That is technically the hypothesis test is again, it's very black and white. It's like, is this normal or is this not normal? And even if it's just like 
barely not normal. Like, like to the human eye, you couldn't even detect this like lack of normality. But this, this statistical test, because of your large sample, can pick up this minor deviation. It will say, hey, it's not normal. And again, the reality is it's not that black and white. The reality is we just need it to be reasonably close to normal. And there's not a hypothesis test that can say and determine, hey, this is, quote, reasonably close to normal. Because of that, we tend to frown upon or avoid hypothesis tests. Now, I don't know. I mean, if you really, really were on the fence about whether a histogram is normal or not normal, again, my recommendation is if you're on the fence, it's probably good enough. But if you're uncomfortable with that, maybe maybe the hypothesis test becomes like a tiebreaker for you. But I definitely wouldn't use it as like your first line of decision making. Um, that said, just to kind of show you what they look like and make you aware of them, you can get these tests and their p-values um, by using the normal command in proc univariate. All right, so here we are, back to our serial data set. So there's proc univariate. I use the plots command, so we'll take a look what the plot looks like. I use the normal command um, so we can see what the tests of normality say. So there it is. Here I got the ODS graphics. They look a lot nicer than that little ASCII thing of the box plot that got screwed up earlier. Um, the top picture is the histogram of residuals. Notice next to it is a nice looking box plot. So actually that's kind of like the ODS version of that thing, right? We have the kind of stem and leaf type plot on the left and then we got the, uh, we got the box plot on the right. And then on the bottom we have that QQ plot. So, um, that, that blue, that solid blue line is kind of the line that we want. And then the circles are the line that we get. And so what we want is we want those two lines to overlap. The more they overlap, the better. Now I'll tell you right now, I was not raised on QQ plots. Some people like them, some people use them. For me, it's tough to say like those lines are close or not close. So if you have trouble with that, hey, I, I, I'm with you. Um, but I point them out and, and show them to you. I'm not going to emphasize them much in this classroom, but I want you to be aware of them, let you know how they work. Again, some people do use them. I would say we focus on that histogram. Now, notice this histogram is a little bit weird. It's like all kind of condensed together. Part of why it's all condensed together, if we look at that very, very top of that histogram, we see like a little blip at the number nine. Hey, there's that Quaker Oats. Right? So that Quaker Oats, probably we should have fixed it. Probably we should have removed it from the data. For pedagogical purposes, I left it in to kind of show like how this would show up in like other um, aspects of our, of our diagnostic process. And that value right there is kind of, kind of creating this sort of crunched effect. So we, we kind of only have like these kind of three bars that actually have any type of like actual height to them. But if we were to look at those three bars, I guess it looks normal, right? We got this kind of, this bar in the middle. It's flanked by two bars that are very reasonably close in height, indicating a certain amount of symmetry. Realistically, what I would do is I would probably, you know, I, got, I, I would fix that nine. In fact, we'll see in a slide, I do fix the nine. So we'll see what this looks like. But I, I would say maybe that looks reasonably normal, um, just given the three bars that we have to work with. Now notice what our hypothesis tests say. Our hypothesis tests, um, right, are all extremely significant. They're all like essentially off the charts, right? It's all less than some number. So that's kind of like off the charts small. So our, our normality tests are going crazy. Our normality tests are saying reject the null hypothesis, which is saying that, right, at the, at the 0.05 significance level, there's very strong evidence that, right, we should reject um, the normality of our... Um, of our residuals, which kind of disagrees with kind of what we saw in that histogram. So yeah, here it is. Here's what I was saying. Um, right, with the exception of one observation, it looks as if the data follows a roughly normal distribution. Admittedly, we kind of just have those three bars to work with. But that one observation is enough to fool our hypothesis tests into rejecting the null hypothesis again. Right, these hypothesis tests can just like latch on to just essentially one observation. 
and then just base the whole hypothesis test off that one anomaly. Whereas the reality is one anomaly probably doesn't matter that much. We just need it to be reasonably close to normal, not perfectly normal. Now, realistically, we should remove that observation. We should have removed that observation or fixed the observation. All right, because of because of all this quarantining stuff, I didn't have the time to go to Giant Nacme and get the actual value, what that what that negative one should have been. So I just went ahead and removed it. Things look a lot better now, actually, right? The the QQ plot looks a little nicer. When you get to the rightmost end of the QQ plot, it looks like it curves off the chart a little bit, which means the tails may be like a little different than what we would expect on a normal distribution, but the kind of center part kind of overlaps nicely. That histogram looks a little bit more nice as well, doesn't it? And even though it looks like it might have a little bit of skew, I guess that tail looks like it's tapering to the large values so that would be, that'd be a right skew distribution it looks like maybe it has a little bit of right skew that skew is not really pronounced and a little bit of right skew is not problematic again i look at that i say it looks eh, it looks close to normal looks reasonable reasonable reasonably normal if there's skew there it's just it's just a small amount certainly looks nicer getting rid of that observation makes our histogram look look, uh, look smoother. And also notice our hypothesis tests look better. Admittedly, some of them still, actually I, technically three out of four, still reject the null hypothesis. But the one that we're told to usually focus on, the one that's used most commonly, the Kamalgarov Smirnov, says fail to reject the null hypothesis. Again, right, another reason not to use hypothesis tests is sometimes you get this disagreement and now you're not even sure. I don't know. One of them says it's normal. One of them says it's not normal. What does that mean? What the cut the? So, right. In terms of that normality, removing that observation, looking at the histogram, I would say the histogram looks reasonably close to normal. As such, I think our normality assumption is satisfied. Check. All right. One down, three to go. What about the mean of zero? Well, it turns out the sample mean of the residuals will always be zero. So it turns out there's not really anything to test there, right? It makes sense we would use the sample mean to test the theoretical mean, but it'd always be zero. It's just kind of the way the residuals work mathematically. So nothing to really test there. Now, the mean of zero assumption is sometimes tied in with this idea of linearity. It's a little technical. I've decided, the book does talk about it. Um, I've decided to de-emphasize that. Um, linearity is, is largely, um, it's largely a byproduct of like how you specify your model. And I've been teaching you how to specify your model in sort of the correct ways, or at least like the ways that are correct for the framework of multiple linear regression. So we're not going to we're not going to we're not going to create a model that violates linearity. Now there's some technical issues kind of a little bit beyond that, but again, it's sort of beyond the scope of this class. So so in terms of sort of testing that mean of 0, we're going to sort of not worry about that one. So check. And so then that leaves us with what? That leaves us with a uh, homogeneity of variance and uh, independence both of these can be tested um, through a plot of the residuals versus the predicted values um, sometimes referred to as a residual plot um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this so first off like what's the ideal residual plot look like the ideal residual plot looks like um, a scatter plot um, in which we have a random scatter about the line y equals zero y equals zero is kind of that mean of zero right on average the residuals should be zero so 
So here's something kind of new that I cooked up. Um, this really gives you some like pretty fun stuff to do, right? So I know right now, like all these people are like posting all kinds of like cool activities online. Like, oh, you're stuck in your house for like the next, I don't know, three months. <laughs> like, what are you gonna do to keep from going crazy? Like, well, why not simulate data? Like, I mean, that's what it is. It's all like artsy stuff. Oh, oh, you can like, oh, you could doodle. Oh, you could scrapbook. Oh, you could write a program to simulate a bunch of data to figure out how to like assess uh, violations of regression assumptions. Sounds fun to me, I'm in. So check this program out. Like I, I wrote it, we're gonna look at it, but I really encourage you to like tweak this program. Play around with this program. It's pretty straightforward, right? So here I am simulating a data set. That do statement is creating a thousand observations. Now I have to come up with a bunch of X variables. So here I'm just generating um, a bunch of X variables between uh, one and a hundred. To be honest, I guess I, I use that floor command. The floor command takes something. So I guess first start with this. So the Rand uniform is going to, and you probably talked about this a little bit in 5.11. It's going to, um, to randomly pick a number between one and a hundred, it could be any number, even you know, even fractional or decimal. So it could be like 1.21529. I decided just to kind of keep things simple. I just wanted whole numbers, so I used the floor command. The floor command basically says round it down to the nearest whole number. So we'll see in the proc print all my x's are like whole numbers, but. There's no, it's not like a rule in regression that they have to be whole numbers. So actually in hindsight, I probably could have just left out that floor command. It's not really that essential. Um, so that just generates a bunch of X variables. Then I wanted to simulate some error terms. Now, right, what are our classical assumptions? Our classical assumptions are the errors follow a normal distribution a mean of zero and a common variance that does not depend on X. All right, so there it is, right? I simulate something with a normal distribution, a mean of zero, and I decided to use a variance of two. And then, right, there's my regression model. So I simulated Y equals two plus 10 times X plus error. Then to actually save that to your data set, remember you gotta use the output statement. Then you end your do loop, use the run command, and then on the next slide we'll see a proc print, right? So isn't that pretty cool? Think of like all the fun stuff that we could do with this, right? You could like, I, I don't do it in here, but I mean, it, it would be fun. So now that we simulated it, we've, we've, we've precisely specified the exact mechanism generating our data. We, we, right, we know exactly what the true beta naught is. The true beta naught is, is two. And the true beta one is 10. So it'd be fun to actually maybe run a proc reg on this and see, right, how close beta naught is to two, how close beta one hat is to 10, right? All that kind of fun stuff. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to come up with all kinds of different activities based on this. I'll kind of walk you through the ones relevant to our, uh, to our learning understanding um, of diagnostics. Yeah, so sorry about that. I, I, I can't I can't figure out how to blow up the uh, the output. I, I, I know ways to increase the font size of my code, um, but you might have to do a little bit of squinting um, here. But if you look at observation one, right, we have an X of 13, an error of one. Right. So what was what was our um, what was our equation? It was two. Plus 10 times X plus error. So two. 10 times X, 10 times X is 130. 130 plus two is 132. 132 plus that 1.03, well that gives us 133.039. That's our observed Y value. <coughs> so like in reality, right? In reality, we get a data set, we just see X and Y, 
right? The reality is we don't normally know what that error is, and that's what creates kind of the uncertainty in our data set. But when we simulate it, we actually know what that error is, which is kind of nice. So here I run a proc reg. I want to do my um, I want to do my um, residual plot. So I create an output data set called diagnostics. I want to do a plot of predicted values versus residuals. So right, I output these these things. I I output the R student um, jackknife residuals, predicted values, and then I, I use a proc gplot. You can do this nice slash vref command. That means vertical reference. It's going to create a line at y equals zero. And so what's coming up on the next slide. So remember, this data I simulated came from a formula that perfectly satisfied my regression assumptions. Independent, normal distribution, mean of zero, common variance. All those assumptions are satisfied. So the scatter plot that we're going to see on the next slide is what a quote perfect scatter plot should look like. And there it is, right? Looks like random scatter about the value y equals zero, right? Because again, right, the y value is the action is the actual studentized residual. Look at the bulk of them are between two and minus two, as we would expect. Right, probably roughly 95% of our observations are between two and nine, two and negative two. Right, looks like their average is about zero, which it should be. And I see sort of no systematic patterns or funneling. Right, that's 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 a quote perfect scatter plot. You see that, and you say, all right, all my assumptions look good. So so this is the follow -up question. Okay. Well, what would it look like if my assumptions were not satisfied? Well, that's what we're going to explore in the next couple slides. Let's start with homogeneity of variance because this residual plot is, is probably most commonly used to test this third assumption right here, whether or not we have this homogeneous variance. Violations of homogeneity of variance are indicated by what we call a funneling pattern. What does that funneling pattern look like? Well, I can simulate it. Again, this is our fun craft project for uh, for the next couple of weeks. I really encourage you to tinker with this, play around with it, have fun with it. All right? So if I want to violate homogeneity of variance, what does that mean? It means that that my error, the variance of my error term, is no longer the same for every observation, but it differs. In this case, I'm going to say it differs based on the x variable. So what is this saying? It's saying we would expect more variance for larger values of x. Do we see how I built that into how I simulated my data? Pretty neat, right? Again, if you want to play around with things, you could tweak all kinds of stuff. Like what's something else that we could tweak? This would be like a fun project at home. What if you wanted to like look at the histogram of the residuals and play around with that normality assumption? So you could you could take a look at this right now and see that it follows you see what a nice normal histogram shape should look like for the residuals, but you could change that thing. What if you change the 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 errors to follow an exponential distribution? And then take a look at the histogram and see what the histogram looks like if in fact the errors are coming from something other than a normal distribution. That'll give you an idea of like like because even if it comes from a normal distribution, right, the fact that we're only looking at a sample means that there's some noise. And so the idea is if you run the simulation over and over and over and over and you keep looking at these like histograms 
of of um, residuals, you'll see that like none of them are like quote perfectly normal, but they're all kind of close to normal. And we know because we simulated the data that they are coming from a normal distribution. So by doing this a lot, it starts to help us internalize like what's like kind of like an acceptable range of kind of of kind of abnormality in terms of a histogram. Then we can switch it up and try like simulating, okay, if this came from an exponential distribution, what would it look like? And then I know if I see something that looks like that in my data, like that might indicate that it's coming from something other than a normal distribution. Simulation is a powerful tool for understanding some of the very abstract but powerful ideas that drive statistics. I'm doing like a little bit here, focusing on, on kind of like the key points of this lecture, but I really do encourage you to kind of play around with my code. Play around with it, change numbers, and then ask yourself, okay, if I change this number, what do I expect to see? And then see if you're right. That's how you understand like this data and the mechanism and the process, right? Back to the process, uh, better and better. So anyways, here we are, we're simulating a violation of homogeneity of variance, right? We have heterogeneous variance. The variance does depend on X. So let's see what our scatter plot looks like. That's what I mean by funneling pattern. Do we see it? This is very pronounced. This is very clear cut. Most commonly you see the funneling pattern in this direction. That is for larger values as you're moving to the right, you see that variation growing larger. But in theory, it can go the other way. That is, in, in, you can have situations where the, 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 the variation, the large amount of variation is on the left and the variation diminishes as it moves to the right. So you could have the opposite pattern. But of course, right, hopefully we could see quite clearly how that contrasts with the previous slide. So this type of funneling is what's indicative of a violation of homogeneity of variance. Now, again, like the normality, regression's pretty robust to violations of this assumption. So we're, again, we're looking for pretty striking funneling patterns. If you find yourself looking at a scatter plot and going back and forth and back and forth, and you're like, eh, I don't know, maybe there's funneling, maybe there's not funneling, I'm not sure, then you're probably fine. Now, this is more extreme than what you're going to see in practice, but right, still, you want something along these lines. You look at this, and there's obvious funneling. You don't second guess it at all. And so that then is indicative of some kind of violation of, uh, of homogeneity of variance. So check. So the last assumption is what? The last assumption is independence. Now, we're talking about residual plots, so we'll talk about how residual plots can, can illustrate violations of independence. But, I would say that probably the best way to, to at least think about whether or not independence or dependence is going to be a problem is, again, going back to those first few steps. Slide one, where I said, get to know your data set. Ask yourself, how was the data gathered? What are the actual observations? What are the actual variables? Usually knowing what the data is, how it was gathered, in common sense, is enough to tell us whether or not we might expect there to be dependency in our data. Right. That is, if we have a bunch of students in our data, in our in our in our um, in our sample, and we have students that are all clustered or all from the same classroom, and we're in, in our y variable is some like you know some measurement of scholastic knowledge. It would be reasonable to suspect that there might be dependence in our data, right? That is, if, if we have a bunch of students in the same class, 
whether one student knows a particular topic is probably related to another. That is, if one student in a class knows a particular topic, it's probably more likely that the other students also know that topic, right? Because they have the same teacher, they were exposed to the same lessons, so on and so forth. So again, the starting point for whether or not we think independence is gonna be violated is just thinking, critically thinking about the data. In an economic setting, there's something referred to as a time series analysis. That's where we look at some metric, like maybe like the, the like like a the value or price of a stock. That's our y variable, and our x variable is time. We would expect dependency in a time series setting, wouldn't we? That is right. The value of the stock today probably in some way depends on what it was yesterday. Agreed? And similarly, the value of that stock tomorrow probably depends on what it was today. Right? Things tend to change for the most part gradually. And that creates this sort of dependency process. Now I say that there are certain types of dependence that you can see in a, in a scatter plot of residuals. So here's, um, here's something. This type of situation is called positive um, autocorrelation. So it can occur in um, that time series setting that I was talking about. Positive autocorrelation is, is the idea where um, a positive residual tends to be followed by another positive residual and a negative residual tends to be followed by a negative residual, and that creates this kind of um, periodic sinusoidal type shape. I mean, that's not, it's not a perfect sine curve by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly it looks like a rough sine curve, doesn't it? This incidentally was simulated in R. I just happened to have a convenient R program that I wrote to simulate this kind of autocorrelation process, so hopefully you're okay with it. Um, but I mean, the idea behind positive autocorrelation is what? Like, imagine that this is like a like that. So, so that that x-axis is like time. So we're moving from like time zero to time 100. Maybe this is like every day, maybe every week. Maybe let me say we're looking at stock price over a week. And the y-axis is residuals, right? So if you look right in the kind of middle of our residual plot, we have a bunch of positive residuals, don't we? A positive residual means what? A positive residual means that the actual stock price was more than what we expect it to be based on our model. The stock price was more than we expected it to be. So the question is like, why? Why, why is that stock better than expected? And right, there's probably a whole bunch of answers to that question. There's probably a conspiracy of circumstance, right? It could be that just in general, the economy is doing well. It could be that that company, right, just implemented a really effective advertising campaign. It could be that that company just released a new product. Maybe we're talking about Disney, a new movie. Season two of The Mandalorian, right? What, whatever. But the idea is, right, whatever slew of circumstance conspired to, to make this stock perform better than expected, that same stew of circumstance is probably in play tomorrow, right? That is, if it was a good economy today and that they had a good advertising campaign today and, and they had this new product, right, that was out today, that all of that stuff is still probably a factor tomorrow. So if all of those things, right, created a positive residual today, I would expect to also see a positive residual tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. But eventually, right, Fortuna's wheel is always spinning. At some point, the economy turns. 
at some point people get sick of this advertising campaign at some point this new product is no longer a new product and our actual price gets closer to the predicted price our residuals start getting close to zero and who knows right now we maybe have a little bit of a recession right maybe right our competitors just released some new product now we have a negative residual now we're performing a little worse than expected and again Whatever the reason is we're doing worse than expected, those reasons will probably persist for some time, and so we might expect some negative residuals for a while. And that's what creates the sinusoidal pattern. So when we look at a residual plot and we see kind of a very systematic pattern, often maybe something sinusoidal or curved like this, that can mean violation of dependency. But again, in terms of dependency, I would, I would encourage us to actually start at kind of what's my data and where did it come from and what does common sense tell me about whether I think these Y values are going to depend on any other Y values. So back to our serial. What does a residual plot of our serial look like? So there it is. Looks a little weird, right? We want to be careful. The human eye, the human eye, it's been shown, all kinds of psychological studies. The human eye has evolved. It has adapted to finding patterns. Humans are amazing at finding patterns. We're probably, at this point, too good at finding patterns, right? That's what like kept us alive when we were like cavemen and cavewomen. Right? We're walking through the jungle and, and we see like a pattern or maybe, right, more importantly, a deviation from a pattern. Normally all our leaves look one way, but there's a broken leaf and, and, and our eye really fixates on that broken leaf. And that means that there's a saber tooth tiger, right, who just walked through here. We need to be careful. Just saved our lives. It's less life in stakes when we're analyzing these curves, but... Right. Nonetheless, it's out there. I mean, there's plenty of stories, right, where people are like, oh, my God, like I just saw like the face of Jesus Christ in my pancake. And you look at that pancake and you're like, yeah, it does kind of look like Jesus Christ. Now, again, I'm not trying to practice sacrilege. Is it really a message from Jesus Christ? Probably not. It's what? It's that human beings are good at finding patterns. So be careful when you look at these residual plots. It's easy to look at that and just see some pattern and say like, oh, there's a pattern going on. What does that mean? We're usually looking for very specific patterns, right? First and foremost, funneling. I look at this thing. I definitely don't see any very pronounced funneling. Agreed? Since I don't see any pronounced funneling, I think that I'm good in terms of my homogeneity of variance assumption. I don't see any pronounced or clear-cut sinusoidal patterns. Yeah, I guess on the left, it does look like a lot of negatives, but after that, it looks like a lot of up and downs. So I would probably say, again, no pronounced sinusoidal patterns. I would go back to like how the data was gathered. This is just a bunch of cereals kind of randomly selected from the shelves of a supermarket. I don't know that I would expect the whatever it was we were measuring, the calorie content of, say, the first cereal I grabbed to in any way relate to, say, the fifth cereal that I grabbed. So, again, assuming that these things were sort of randomly selected, because of that random selection process, I would expect independence of my data. I don't really see anything in the scatter plot to um, contradict that. There are gaps in there, right? And and that's kind of what we're seeing. We see these kind of like, um, looks almost like parallel diagonal lines, right? That's really just kind of a product of kind of gaps in our data and um, some of the kind of discrete ways of measuring things. Not really indicative of that. We don't want to make more of it than we need to. So, this is the conclusion I would come to. There is no obvious funneling. 
hence homogeneity of variance seems satisfied. There are no pronounced systematic patterns, hence there is no evidence of dependence. This is consistent with what I would expect, assuming that we took a simple random sample of serials. We couple this with our earlier observation that our histogram of the residuals seemed reasonably normal, and our final conclusion would be that our assumptions seem well satisfied. Phew. All right, we got three of these uh, suckers down. We've done, I think, roughly 80 slides in total. We still got another 30 slides to go. So why don't you take a little bit of breather, and then why don't you come back and we'll continue our, um, our ever exciting discussion um, of diagnostics.